Hello everyone, I'm Keith Webster, Helen and Henry Posner, Junior Dean of University Libraries, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, Global Advocacy for Local Change, a conversation with Ambassador Maritza Chan, Permanent Representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations. This afternoon's event is hosted by Carnegie Mellon's Sustainability Initiative, a priority of Provost Jim Garrett. The initiative is home to Carnegie Mellon's endeavours towards a more sustainable future, and we support the university's efforts to advance the global goals, 17 objectives identified by the UN, to guide the planet toward peace and prosperity now and in the future. The initiative is led by Alex Hineker. Alex's approach to sustainability is informed by 15 years of experience working across the globe, and also by her time as the Senior Director of the Global Goals Programme at the New York City Mayor's Office for International Affairs. She now works with our community to incorporate the global goals into our education, research and practices. Joining Alex is Ambassador Maritza Chan, the first woman to serve as the permanent representative of Costa Rica to the UN. She'll share her country's priorities at the UN, how she employs the global goals to advance that agenda, and how universities can help the world achieve these ambitious objectives by 2030. As always, I'm grateful to my colleagues at the University Libraries who have worked so hard to bring this event to you, and most especially our events and external relations teams. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Centre for Student Diversity and Inclusion, the Department of Modern Languages, Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy, the Institute for Politics and Strategy, the School of Design and the Steinbrenner Institute for Environmental Education and Research. Many thanks to all of them for their support. At the end of the afternoon, you'll have a chance to join in the conversation, and I encourage you to submit your questions to inform a discussion on how we can all prioritize the global goals in our work and daily lives. Thank you all again for joining us today. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to Alex to get the discussion started. Thank you, Dean Webster, and thanks so much to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm really excited about this panel, which we've been planning for quite some time, uh, where we'll hear from a dear friend of mine that I've had the pleasure of working with for many years. Um, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Marisa Chan, who's a Costa Rican career diplomat, acad academic, and activist, and she's the first woman to serve as the Costa Rica's permanent representative to the United Nations since Costa Rica signed the United Nations Charter in 1945. She has over two decades of professional experience at the highest political level. She's represented Costa Rica before the United States in multilateral organizations in both Washington, D.C. and New York. She's an expert on international peace and security issues and an advocate for the women, peace and security agenda. Thanks so much time for uh, th thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today, Ambassador Chen. Thank you, Alex, and thank you to all of you for being here with us today. Um, I'm very pleased to to speak to your students and and talk about my experience and and hopefully some of my thoughts and um, advices can be used for them in their careers. I'm certain I can. So as I mentioned, I've had the I've had the pleasure of working with Ambassador Chan of the United Nations over the past decade, and I've seen firsthand the impact that she's had. And now that I'm responsible for Carnegie Mellon University's implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, I see so many ways that the work that our students, faculty, and staff are doing mm -hmm. is contributing to this ambitious global agenda. For example, all of our co-sponsors that Dean Webster mentioned are teaching courses that are related to Costa Rica's priorities at the United Nations. So I thought it would be really helpful to have Ambassador Chan join us to help make those links between what we're doing in our daily lives and what we're interested here at our university and how she's working to make the world more sustainable and how these topics are being addressed at the United Nations. So let's get into it. Wow. Um, sir. To, you know, the, the priorities of Costa Rica, the United Nations, it, it, it is, are, are ambitious. We not only pay attention to international peace and security, um, and that comes with excessive, you know, paying attention to excessive military spending or military spending, um, especially in a world that's post-pandemic, 
uh, we pay attention to the rule of law, to the fight to, against impunity, human rights, and particularly women and girls' rights, sustainable development, financial development, uh, middle-income countries, because Costa Rica is one, and middle-income countries are facing a major um, challenge in this current environment because the attention is going to least developed countries and not us who did things well. Uh, we also pay attention to conflict man management and resolution, mediation, the role of regional organizations, um, international law, international humanitarian law, the fight against terrorism, um, the working methods of the Security Council, the reform of the Security Council, the revitalization of the General Assembly, in particular, the election of the Secretary General, as well as the role of the President of the General Assembly, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, the Youth, Peace and Security Agenda, protection of civilians, and this is where all our work in, in disarmament plays a role, the SDGs, particularly, you know, in a world post-pandemic as a roadmap, as our common agenda, and and how can we make this world safer and better than we found it? Basically, that's in a nutshell, that's our priorities here at the UN. That's a lot. And I know that you're very busy, which is especially why I'm so grateful that you took the time to join us today. And for our listeners, I want to provide a little bit of context about the United Nations, because a lot of people think of it as one big meeting that happens every September where world leaders come and make big proclamations that may or may not come true. But what's interesting is that there's so much work happening throughout the year. So you have the United Nations General Assembly with 193 members. The General Assembly has six committees ranging from peace and security topics to human rights, to decolonization, to the law, to the budget. We have the United Nations Security Council. We have, uh, with uh, that addresses many of the topics you just mentioned. And then there's all of the UN agencies and the United Nations Secretariat, which is the people working to do this. So how do you manage addressing all of these critical topics across these many different um, UN agencies and departments and negotiating with your um, other diplomats? Well, it's a lot of work. Um, it takes a lot of my own personal commitment. I do have a team that are, it's comprised of six experts, that each expert is doing one committee. But you think about it's a lot of work for just one person. Uh, there are states who have three, four, five, or even 10, 15, you know, representatives for just one committee. That's not the case in Costa Rica. Um, the, the advantage we have is that we're guided by principles. And when you, when you negotiate based on principle, it's much easier to call for better transparency, for real funding, for more coherence within the system. Because the UN is a very complex web of systems, organs, agency programs. And, and this second time around that I have come back to the UN, it's been a very interesting opportunity to to untangle the UN as it is and to navigate those waters. And it, it takes a lot of my own personal experience, my mm -hmm. own commitment in making sure that not only I'm able to address the issues at hand, but also where I'm located in the list of speakers, because most of the ambassadors will be at the first session of a debate, but they will not attend the second part of the session. So you need to make sure that you speak also the first part of the session that takes foresight mm -hmm. and, and in, in, in translating that experience, my own experience as an expert to my own colleagues here, um, it gives us an edge to be able to engage and also had a fresh take on issues that probably some countries will look in through different lenses than us. And, and that's a take that I want for delegations. What is the takeoff of what Costa Rica said? What was this? you know important um that comes from my own background as a as a speech writer but also uh, knowing that at the un it doesn't matter how big your country is it just matters the strength of your principles the 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 voice in which you call for change you actually call out people when or member states when they're doing things that are against the un charter or against you know international law international humanitarian law so it's a very complex, um, but you know, I don't complain. I just <laughs> deliver. <laughs> yeah, I um, 
one thing I, I'll, you know, you mentioned that you were at the UN before and you went down to DC and did some, um, you um, did service there and you've come back to the United Nations uh, as the first woman to serve as uh, the ambassador of Costa Rica. And I'm so curious, having this new title, having this new, how has that influenced how you're able to engage in discussions, how people listen to you? Has it changed? Because I've always admired the fact that you've been a leader even before you had the titles because of the, precisely the approach you took to this and, and your incredible work ethic. So I'm curious how it's changed with the, this new fancy title. Um, it's more, you know, I have more responsibility on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. I don't have much freedom as I wish and never that I ever had, you know, but I don't have the, the luxury of just saying, I'm going to focus on just disarmament because the, the agenda of Costa Rica, the UN is more than disarmament or, or international peace and security. And I have, you know, I have to force myself to be more confident and learn more about sustainable development, for instance, financial mm -hmm. development, human rights. Um, and those were things that I, they were part of my other colleagues agenda. The bar for a woman is always higher. And don't let, you know, and, and I'm and being completely honest, and this is an honest conversation between you and I, the bar will be higher for us everywhere, anytime. So I'm not just um, challenged to be technically uh, stronger in issues that I never have to deal with. I have to be um, gracious, uh, engaged, interested. Uh, I don't have the luxury of being tired. Um, you are like an actress that are able to deliver at, at, at a point mm -hmm. um, you have to attend events. Sometimes you have to speak without a script. Um, and that's something that you must be very, you must be very careful about because the words of that coming from your mouth are the words of a state. You represent the voice of Costa Rica. In a way, I'm also fortunate because that gives me an edge. Um, it gives me some gravity when I stress how uncomfortable we are with injustice, with impunity, with how much, you know, suffering certain people in the world are facing and are enduring because those who have the power to change the status quo won't do it because it benefits them uh, militarily, economically, uh, geopolitically. So that gives me certain, you know, uh, credibility and legitimacy when engaging yeah. with certain actors. Uh, but the challenges remain there uh, at every stage. Also, I'm quite young for the position I am. Um, mm -hmm. and, and certain member states have said that it's unthinkable to, to have a female, an ambassador of my age uh, at the United Nations. But um, I'm here, I'm here to stay. Um, I haven't been in this title for one year. And I already, you know, have gained some traction and visibility. Um, and, and I owe that to the clarity of our positions. You know, we are ambiguously clear on where we stand and the values and principles that we defend. And there's honor in that. Yeah, and I think also, as you mentioned, you have the, the background on all of this. You've been in, the, you've done the work. You know how these negotiations are, um, are conducted and actually what happens behind the scenes, like I mentioned throughout the year. And we already have a great question from a the audience member that I think is relevant to what you just said, which is how you work to promote these values across countries while taking into consideration the cultural differences and how they may affect a nation's political goals with the 193 countries. We respect. Um, there are negotiations like I'm, I'm the co-chair of the vice president of the open and the working group on um, conventional munitions and think about you know weapons and guns but guns are useless without the ammunition is the ammunition is what makes them lethal so we are in the we're going to head into the third session of that open and the working group and and sometimes as the vice chair 
um, I take the role of negotiating on the sidelines with certain delegations, part of the text that requires more work. I can do it individually and that I can mm -hmm. do it with a group of countries. How do, you know, for me is respect, showing that you understand where they're coming from. Um, I never, I have never found any delegate who were not, were not comfortable. I try to be always with, you know, uh, with a balanced team, gender balanced team, but two, one or two, you know, one man and a woman with me. So that person mm. would feel uncomfortable and understanding where they're coming from and try to find it around. And you will be surprised how many people want to find it around. Um, and the level of ambition can be, you know, if there's, we can find that balance, if we're able to, to for every member state to see where each other's coming from, maybe, just maybe we are able to have something. And I'll, I'm very surprised of the things that we are able, we have been able to manage and achieve in this year and a half that I, in, yeah, in the last year uh, with things that, you know, were unthinkable to achieve in, in this global environment that we're facing now, very challenging. Yeah, and I mean, one of the issues that you just mentioned is disarmament, and both you personally and the country you represent are considered global leaders on this topic. I mean, I know you through, we first met through your um, work as Costa Rica was the president of the Convention on Cluster Munitions, but uh, you know, you're also the lead negotiator for the Arms Trade Treaty. Costa Rica recently hosted a conference where over 30 countries called for a ban on autonomous weapons. You actively speak out on the links between disarmament and environment. I can go on. Oh, ex use of heavy explosive weapons in populated areas. You were instrumental to that declaration. Um, you've been recognized by the United Nations Regional Center for Peace, Disarmament, and Development in Latin America and the Caribbean. Caribbean is one of the leading agents for change. There's so much, there's a lot to discuss, um, uh, but I want to start off with the fact that Costa Rica has does not have a military. Um, uh, can you share more about why that is and how you manage to ne navigate these negotiations with great military powers and have so much success across this broad range of issues? Well, um, uh, I think that the fact that we don't have a military, it's, it has played an advantage in our advantage. 50% mm -hmm. of our GDP goes to education. We have universal uh, health coverage for everyone. Um, we were we are the first country in the world who were able to revert deforestation. So now, practically, we're aiming to 60% of the country being reforested. 99% of our electric uh, grid comes from these renewable sources. So by having a very strong civil service and as a civil servant i can mm -hmm. tell you that is the quality of our public sector that has made costa rica what it is it has taken also enlightened like leadership that we always have had good very good presidents mm -hmm. across party lines have one vision, one mission, and one vision of what Costa Rica should look like, and that have been able to take us where we need to be in different times in history. So when in 1949, when the armed forces were abolished, we started taking a different path, and the temptation to to go to the to weapons to resolve our conflicts were dismantle. Mm -hmm. We also created a culture of peace and mediation that um, some friends of mine from Colombia said, listen, pay attention to what the Costa Ricans do. Um, there were like uh, five or six of eight students um, doing like a model UN and they said, okay, let's vote. What kind of pizza we want? So they voted and, and everybody, that's what we do. You know, we mm -hmm. don't oppose ourselves. Uh, and we try to find the middle ground. And I think that's that's cultural. And I don't have to explain that to my own colleagues because that level of ambition, my, my own experts here at the UN have it. They understand that we need transparency. Um, they understand that impunity must be, it's, it's a bygone of this era. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we must um, ask for equality. 
uh, that that comes from from nine it's not an ideal it's a must if you if we are able you know especially the global south if we want to achieve the fruits of our labors and enjoy uh those th that harvest um that is something that i can say that it you know it's an advantage and it helps us by negotiating based on principles uh, principle-based negotiation is much easier than having to deal with just commas. You can identify the paragraphs that are relevant yeah. to request or you know to to enact change. Um, and 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 we have seen many many successes. Well, yeah, I mean, Costa Rica was the lead negotiator. Our um, ambassador White um, led the process for the treaty for the uh, to ban nuclear weapons yeah. um and that is a huge accomplishment and i know that you personally also uh played a really important role and are passionate about this issue and that took many years can you tell us a little bit about your role in this process for um for negotiating the treaty because you were both at the un and i think in the us for a little bit i'm not sure but no, yeah no. i was back in costa rica so ah, okay I left the UN when uh, in February 2016, and um, I went back to Costa Rica, and I was handled the desk of the Organization of American States in Washington. After doing this, um, and then they give me a um, a CICTE, that is a Committee on Terrorism. I was the expert to to attend those negotiations, so um, I was not doing any UN related issue. Uh, they wanted me to do on street treaty, but it was not related to what I was doing. And, and being the mm. that officer of of um, a, a, a just one organization by yourself, it's a lot. So, and and that organization requires ministers to travel to Washington back and forth, and you need to be the liaison with the ministries. So, but the ambassador of Costa Rica here, he used to be my boss, um, talked to the minister and said. Costa Rica is the president, but that means that all my team will go to work with her and we'll lose our voice. We cannot lose our voice. Mm -hmm. Do you please send Maritza for one month to New York so we won't miss that chance. So I remember that I came here the, the, after the first week of general statements and engaged until the end of the treaty. And I remember focusing a lot in the positive obligations and and being part, you know, of these um, small groups of negotiations, power groups, because that happens usually when you have a treaty um, or a big negotiation, the major stakeholders are the ones who have different levels of ambition but are more vocal about it, are called to a separate room and there's where you find common ground. Um, it was a very interesting um, process, but what I'm happy about is that we did not lose our voice because by being president, yeah. you, you you just are you're there. You know, not necessarily you have to engage, but we were able to do both, and, and that 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 mattered. That's a great point. I didn't think about that because you're the neutral party, I guess, in a way, managing with all of this, but you also have so much to say about it. Um, in terms of your experience and perspective, and like you yourself know all of the mechanisms through the many first committee resolutions that um, you had already negotiated over over your time there. Um, <clears throat> that brings me to another question that, uh, speaking of negotiations, that I wanted to ask about, um, because it's making the news a little bit in my rounds, is there's this new effort to recognize the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right and to call for greater global efforts to ensure that this is upheld and this is being discussed i guess in the united at the united nations in new york and geneva where there's a human rights um council human rights commission um and uh you have played such an instrumental role about that uh, costa rica has played such an instrumental role in that i think even introducing the yep. resolution so mm -hmm. what do you hope to achieve by this resolution, um, can you tell us more about how it came about and and um, the process of it? So this resolution was adopted first in Geneva, the Human Rights Council, but the Human Rights Council is not universal in membership. The General Assembly is. So we brought it to the General Assembly and it was an historic vote. It obtained 
0.3% of support, the highest so far for this type of resolution. The oh. example was resolution 64 slash 292, which recognized a human right to water and sanitation in 2010. And that resolution had 122 votes in favor out of 163, 74.8 support. So we had 95.3 support. Um, why is just resolution relevant? Because um, it, it it has many implications. It's um, it recognizes the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right, as a universal human right, which makes environmental protection a fundamental aspect of human rights protection. And it also it's a it's an very important step towards towards the introduction of human rights perspective in environmental litigation and mm -hmm. integrates human rights norms into environmental norms. And it sends a very strong political message um, that it will help shaping and strengthening stronger international environmental laws, standards, and policies at the national, regional, and international level. Um, and it shows also that the multilateral system has a role to play in international environmental law. It was the ground that cemented the way forward to the resolution that we just adopted by consensus uh, with another group of countries with Vanuatu to ask uh, an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice on climate change and, and, and human rights. So something on climate justice. And now the ICJ will have to respond to that question, but that our resolution paved the ground for that. And I'm certain mm -hmm. that we paved the ground for many more other resolutions or you know um, decisions at the international level. Yeah, I think it's emblematic of also the sustainable development goals or the principles behind the sustainable development goals, recognizing I conveniently have the background of the 17 sustainable development goals here, that there are so many different topics that are related to sustainability. It's about poverty and hunger, good health and well-being. Um, I personally am still shocked that goal 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions was agreed to by all 193 member states. Yeah. Of course, they're not perfect, but they're a really important framework that we can use as countries. You know, I used to uh, lead New York City's Sustainable Development Goals Program, and now as universities. And I think that um, making these links, as you did, between the human rights and the environment, and also what you've done by making the links between um, conflict in the environment through some of the work I know that you've been doing with PACS is really important because all of the goals are equally important and none of them can be achieved on their own. But sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming to look at 17 goals, 169 targets, 232 indicators and say, all right, let's get into it. So um, I think it's, it's a great step and I congratulate you on, on making that effort. I know nothing is easy when it comes to bringing people together around controversial topics like this. Um, and that brings me to my next question a little bit more about your engagement with universities, because you're also an academic. And as mentioned, we at CMU have committed to the sustainable development goals, not only because um, we believe our operations contribute to making the world more sustainable for all, but we also see that um, the way that we're educating not just our students, but our faculty and staff is really important for thinking about how we're going to solve some of the world's greatest challenges. We also conduct a ton of research and I think I'm new to academia and I see so many great opportunities to better link all of the research that's going on with my colleagues and what's happening at the UN in New York. But I think it's a little bit hard sometimes to see how these big global um, discussions that you're talking about relate to the day-to-day -day activities that we're conducting here, either in our personal life or in our research, our education, our practices. So. What do you think about the links between how universities can help contribute to the sustainable development goals? And are you working in your capacity as an academic or with Costa Rican universities on, on these sorts of topics? Well, um, the scholar work and, and universities can, can do many things with us. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Um, we do have a couple of, um, you know, like un systems in which certain universities provide us with interns during um, throughout the year. 
um, you can enter with us virtually or in person. It doesn't have to be in person because we do understand that, that, that not everybody can come to New York and, and rent an apartment and, and at the levels that we are seeing now uh, that are, you know, that it makes, it, that makes, it, I mean, it doesn't mean that entering with an with a mission here is impossible. It is possible if you're interested and engage. What do universities do? Well, we now working we're working with Fletcher and and we probably will have um, a training course for young diplomats uh, from developing countries and small countries that will attend online courses and then in person meetings in in Fletcher. Uh, on climate negotiations and, and which are very technical and we need to create a new cohort of diplomats who are technically strong. Um, I'm also working with um, Columbia University, I think with Pathfinders and SDG 16 um, and they provide us with studies, with research, um, for instance, uh, gun violence, the recognition or common agenda. One of the latest reports of, of the Secretary General recognizes that urban violence, gun violence in cities, have are um, are I'm providing us with more death than conflict. So that that idea that it was in, you know people die more in conflict areas, it's gone. It's happening in our cities because of lack of controls. Um, so we're working with them to bring that about and now to put that into the new agenda for peace. But you cannot achieve any one of the SDGs without SDG 5. We are women and girls. You won't be able to have peaceful and you know, sustainable societies or just achieve um, you know, private sector because it requires gender balance. So there are many of the SDGs that you can make them, you know, compress them um, and, and look into them through a gender lens. And that's something that also, it's been one of my priorities at the UN to translate everything through gender lenses. And, and that has been intellectually stimulating and then you take on issues that not necessarily were on the table, uh, but that comes from an academic background and looking into those issues and reading about it. And, 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 and that gets me the chance to provide a new take on matters that were was not there. So that's how you bring universities into the UN. I also work with SOAS, the University of London, um, and, and they do have a program called Scrap Weapons, and, and they are training diplomats uh, or students mm -hmm. who become future diplomats in international disarmament um, but treaty bodies. So they understand the MPT, the TNW, they understand um, basically the, PO, the program of action, small arms, like weapons, but mostly on nuclear weapons, they work a lot. And yeah. it needs great to have the support because it takes time to learn these issues. It takes a life, you know, it takes years to, to understand the, the, the language and then understand the, the little pieces that will go into negotiation. But if you don't have that background, um, sometimes it's harder, but if you have a student who can look into issues for you and help you advance, at least the research, um, you can make a, a statement much stronger. And, and that elevates the quality of the discussion and elevate the quality of your own statements of the United Nations, then that matters. You know, the words that you put out there matter. They have weight. Mm -hmm. People are listening or engaging, or, you know, your statements will, people will look into your statements for research on the position of Costa Rica on, on X, you know, Y um, issue. And, and I usually pay attention to the summary that the UN does on certain debates, and I can see some of my, you know, positions um, reflected because it was a different angle that brings yeah. that's the academic you know the the academic in me looking into ways to reflect the discourse in a different way or engage in a conversation with an angle that no one else has 
Yeah, and um, I'm glad you met, mentioned nuclear weapons in particular because one of our co-sponsors of this um, event is the School of Design because a professor, Peter Sufelli, is teaching a course about nuclear disarmament. And he actually asked a question that I think is related to this about what some of the what are some of the largest obstacles to global nuclear disarmament and what role might everyday people play in promoting nuclear disarmament? Well, uh, I think that particularly those who live in the countries who have nuclear weapons, um, they need to engage because you, you need to know this. Every minute, a nuclear armed weapon state spend $130,000 a minute. Imagine how much money that is. How many schools can you build? How many people can you reintegrate into society? How many women and girls would have a chance or how many scholarships can you provide to one gen, you know, first generation Afro-Caribbean, you know, uh, American or a first generation Native American or you know, how many opportunities can you have if you were to divert all resources into peace and not to the industry of death? Does the terrorist work? Does it make a difference? Uh, what impact would that have into the environment if there's an explosion? And believe me, um, those weapons are not secure. They are vulnerable to cyber attacks, to accidents, to miscalculation. And having wep you know, weapons in high alert that we saw that just now, a few months ago, with, a year ago with the war to Ukraine and Russia, it's, it's such a bad signal because it's it, the destruction such that um, that you need to be aware of where your tax money is going, and we don't have the problem. But my region, you know, Latin America in the Caribbean is completely denuclearized. We do not have weapons. We declare ourselves a zone of peace, but. That requires a high level of awareness and understanding that your security is, doesn't mean my by my demise. That secure what you know means understanding security through let different lenses to the ones that traditionally we understood of, understand understand it and and also to to understand that human security is different to state security. And if if you um, understand that difference, your whole view, will, world view will change, and you may become an activist and say, okay, there's we have um, we have a situation here that um, that that requires the uh, engagement of the international community. Um, but but please, you know, raise your hand and pay attention to where the money is going because you cannot go to an industry of death and, destroy, uh, and destruction. I really like that idea. Your security does not mean <laughs> my demise. I think that's an important principle to apply, not just to international negotiations around nuclear weapons, but also in our day-to-day -day activities. Yeah. Um, I, there's one other point I wanted to make. You mentioned that you, I, you really um, focus on women and girls and the role of gender at the United Nations. In the entire history of the United Nations, we still have not had a woman serve as a secretary general. In the last campaign, um, there was this entire global effort with millions of people adding their voice, but somehow, somehow, we still could not elect, or the Security Council and eventually the General Assembly could not elect a woman to serve as it. So we're on the seventh secretary general. What do you think it's going to take to finally have a woman serve as the secretary general of the United Nations? And why do you think that matters? Well, it matters as, you know, I'm, I've been very vocal about this because you mm -hmm. cannot preach that you're a champion of human, you know, women's rights. And then as an organization not have women reflected at the high echelons of power. There have always been, you know, we are, this is the 77th General Assembly. And there have only been four women as president of the General Assembly. Four. There has never been a female Secretary General. And the problem 
emanates from the UN Charter. The UN mm -hmm. Charter says that he will be the chief administrative office of the United Nations. He. That error is compounded by the first one resolution from 1946 that says that also reiterates that um, that is a him. <laughs> he because it had always been him. Um, it's it's a matter of principle and also a matter of um, coherence in our message as as the global panacea for nations. Please don't stress that we need women and girls to to achieve every single one of the SDGs, and then don't have that represented at the high echelons of, of the UN. Mm -hmm. It's if we don't, if you cannot see her, you cannot be her. What message are we sending to our, you know, I when I was appointed to permanent representative, I got messages from girls in Costa Rica who said, thank you, because you, you're you telling me that I will be able to be sit in your, in, in your chair. And I want that for every single woman. I want every single woman and girl to open, you know, open the old doors and leave it to your own power, your own intelligence and determination to, 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 to determine your destiny, but not to your gender. And, and I want to see, you know, we, we have gender structure problem at the United Nations full stop. Mm -hmm. It comes from the United Charter and it is, has, you know, it took us 55 years to get the first resolution of the Security Council on Women, Peace and Security. We celebrate a lot women, peace and security, but not the fact that it took us 55 years to get there. So um, it's a matter of principle. It's a matter of time. It's about time. We have a woman as G and that um, every, and that the whole structure per se has, must have gender balance because gender parity is the floor, not the ceiling. So for me, it's a matter of principle of coherence and also uh, to correct an historical injustice um, to women and, and women leaders around the world. I um, I really appreciate that, that the, the idea that's not the floor, it's not, the, but yeah. say that again, it's not the floor, so, because I think something, you know, I'm teaching a class right now called Local Adv Advocacy for Global Change, where we're looking at everything that's happening in, um, in Pittsburgh and trying to link that to mm -hmm. what's being discussed at the United Nations and something that comes up again and again is this question of representation because we have unique to Pittsburgh our own challenges in terms of racial um, um, disparities and economic disparities and I think that the, the, what we keep landing on is that representation is just the first step yeah. being at the table is just the first thing once you actually get there you will have to face many of the same challenges that you faced in your process to get there. And so it's really important, I think, to keep at it. You're not resting on your laurels now that you're the first woman to serve in this. You're still fighting for, um, for these uh, principles that you've clearly committed to. Yeah. Um, but I want to move on. We also um, have some questions that have been submitted by people from the audience and also from students who are taking other courses. I'd add that we have actually Another reason that we thought about doing this is we have someone who leads a study abroad course in Costa Rica for students in our Department of Modern Languages. Her, her name is Teresa Tardio. She is a professor of Spanish. Um, and one of her students submitted a question that I wanted to share with you um, that maybe you can have some insight on, which is that a lot of your work has to do with international peace, disarmament, and nonproliferation. In what ways do you think that? the sustainable development goals and sustainable development goal implementers do a good job of addressing these really big issues. And where do you think there's room for improvement? And the mm -hmm. second part to that question that came up in um, the chat is how do you work to address these um, goals regionally within um, your region? You mentioned that you're all working together. And that was submitted by Robert Summers Berger who graduated in December 22 with a major in IPS and a minor in Hispanic studies. Okay, um, Jesus, um, 
<laughs> it's a big question. Yeah. Regionally, you know. Yeah. Central America. Um, in, we are finally a mind, a, a, a zone free of mind of, of, um, of mines, land free landmines. Mm -hmm. So there are no landmines in Central America, and that's an achievement because we're free. And the yeah. and that was at the Organization of American States that led the effort, and and we're free of of landmines. Um, also, as the Western Hemisphere and 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 uh, through like speaking countries, you know, English and Spanish, and, and some other countries that have French, um, we were, you know, we signed the Treaty of Tlatelolco, uh, mm -hmm. and and there are no room for nuclear weapons in the in, in our nations. Um, also. Can you restructure the question again? Yeah, it was a really big question. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that I'm thinking of when I asked it also is another thing that I really appreciated during my time working with you at the UN is that you worked in partnership with diplomats from all of the countries in your region to address issues like the arms trade treaty, because your region, not your country, but your region is particularly affected by this topic. Um, and I, I appreciated that I could go to ambassador well, now Ambassador Richardson, the ambassador of Jamaica to Japan, and to Charlene, who's in the mission of Trinidad and Tobago, and you all work together to address these um, collective challenges and ensure that that representation happened at the UN. But there are limits to the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you, yeah. what are those limits? Yeah. And okay, um, I think that the the understanding disarmament and development. It's um, it's very complex, and not a lot of people have done research on that interlinkage. And when you look into a military spending and what can be achieved with those resources in terms of uh, achieving the SDG 16 or ensuring SDG 5, making sure that we have uh, drinkable water, <laughs> uh, potable water upstream, downstream, um, cleaner oceans, um those things they do need a lot of research that needs to go into the implementation but now everything is fragmented part of the art of diplomacy is putting those things into context and understanding mm -hmm. that if we do not pay attention to you know the fact that women are spending women and girls are spending millions of hours just bringing potable water from their homes because there's no clean water to drink um, and they could be investing that time in, in their studies in their own empowerment and, and emancipation we won't be able to achieve those 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 goals and to the SDGs it's a roadmap a roadmap that all of us need develop or developing countries or least developing countries as a guide to what do we do in order to get to development and and making you know bringing the SDGs into these conversations is crucial mm -hmm. because this is when you are you're showing that you are engaged at, in in a whole conversation in not just a siloed because if we just translate things into just disarmament or security yeah we are not able to make the interlink the linkages to other issues that are crucial and for instance, and I spoke about this a little, it was looking into security to a general lens that, mm -hmm. that is able to identify that um, the language of nuclear weapons or cyber security is hyper masculized. Um, that also there's two women just professionals in cyber security out of 10 that the gender gap is huge when it comes to these issues that are relevant and current. And why do we have so many women in and girls in certain areas, but not in others, like cybersecurity or mm -hmm. uh, as uh, Secretary General of the UN or President mm -hmm. of the General Assembly? But how can we make those decisions intentional? And I think my appointment was intentional. Mm -hmm. 
in the in in the sense that appointing the first female representative to the UN is a conscious decision of a member state to appoint a woman because we need to create a pattern of uninterrupted male leadership at the UN. Not only and 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 thus that allows me to ask for that same representation at the UN because we were mm -hmm. able to do that. So we are coherent in our local and, and international discourse. So, I like, yeah, I like that word coherency. I think it's really important. And it's it's often, we see a lot of incoherency in, in local and, and global policies. Yeah. Um, I wanna get to a couple more questions because we're getting to the end. Um, one person asks, what's the process for updating the charter so that it better represents the value of our times, considering you mentioned the word that he and him were um, limitations from when the charter was written? I think that um, it requires all member states to pass that amendment to their own Congresses. And, and the last amendment to the charter was done in 1963, I think, mm -hmm. when it was the Security Council was enlarged from 11 to 15 members. Um, it's a very tedious process and not all countries ratify what they uh, sign into. Um, mm -hmm. And especially requires the five permanent members to ratify that in, in their national constitutions. Um, Just, not sorry, for context for everyone, the five permanent members of the Security Council are Russia, China, the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. And um, the Security Council, even though it's only 15 members and those five members are the permanent members, they mm -hmm. often have overarching decision-making priority um, uh, setting, setting um, things instead of the UN General Assembly. So the five members that Ambassador Chan is referring to are those countries, just to be crystal clear. <laughs> those, those five permanent members need to ratify in their own constitution uh, frameworks, you know, the, Sen the Congress and Senate. Um, that amendment to the charter. Mm -hmm. So it's not an easy process. And and some people, you know, in the current international environment wouldn't like to address or get not even get into that. Um because it's 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 a risk. Um but it's a long process and, and believe me, not all countries or member states were aware uh, or are aware of the uh, cascade effect that being a permanent member has, because it translating positions of power in in dividing your you know among the five permanent members the most important organs, funds, and programs in the UN. So you always have an American in UNICEF. You always have an American. In yes. So, oh, is this Russian still leading DPKO, or is that still? Uh, they have counterterrorism. I see. That's right. I forgot that. Um, so we have a, one more question is that we're noticing that some private global corporations are economically more powerful than nations. So how does the UN engage with private corporations that operate in many nations? So how are, the, how are corporations represented or engaging at the United Nations? I think it, it depends. It depends on the processes. And, and even, you know, there are discussions in which we, we have to claim or ask for relevant stakeholders to be involved in the discussion because this is organization driven by and, and, and that, represented, that represent the voices of the member states, states, not uh, NGOs, not companies, not um, CEOs, member states. But for for us, for Costa Rica, we need civil society, we need private sector, we need companies to address issues that require the expertise. For example, cybersecurity. The cybersecurity, um, it's we are basically lagging behind a discussion that it has taken place internationally at the private sector, and member states are just addressing these issues now. And we 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 just, you know, we we have just an open and the uh, process of, for five years to address um, the peace and security aspects of ICTs. So in certain cases, we don't have that engagement. Philanthropy, we don't have that engagement. Uh, and it is true, certain companies have, have more uh, resources or GDP than our own states. And, and 
and that's how it is. But but the voices that are represented and heard here are those countries recognized by international, you know, law. Yeah. No, it's been really interesting when I when I, I mentioned I was um, the director of New York City's program and navigating the role of cities in UN discussions, considering cities implement the majority of sustainable development goals was, you know, there sometimes and it was really welcome, but at the end of the day, and I don't disagree with this, it's member states who are the ones who vote um, and who have positions and we should be working with our national governments. But it's also interesting to navigate how, you know, civil society yeah. and other actors do um, have a role to play at the United Nations. And that's of course, working with really supportive partners like you and your colleagues who are engaging with universities, with um, cities, with other, um, other private sector actors. So we're coming, we have one minute left. I wanna conclude by asking you a really simple question, but very difficult one, which is, you know, you've worked on these issues for decades and sometimes it can be really, really challenging when you go in and just people aren't agreeing and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. What is, what is, what motivates you personally to keep going when you don't see that there's a resolution coming right away to the many different topics that you work on? Simple. I want to leave this world better than I found it. All right. And, and I do that, you know, I mentor young women. Um, I specifically only have female um, interns for me to help me with my things, with my um, engagements. Um, and I will tell you, you know, if we have to be, if you are, you know, taking your class and an and implementer at the city level, that makes a difference. If you have someone like you doing that at the New York level, it means that someone is really paying attention to a commitment that was taken worldwide. Um, and, and the indicators for that, city will be higher because there was someone who was paying attention. So I'm that someone who's paying attention to things that are not that little that will make mm -hmm. the difference for another woman in my, in my shoes coming from the global south and engaging in the big boys game uh, with intelligence, integrity, competence, and also um, by doing it with grace and, and, and wisdom, certain kind of wisdom that we are in, in a tremendous deficit of. Well, I don't have anything to add after that. That was a perfect conclusion. And I, again, thank you so much for taking the time and also to our audience for um, taking the time to join us today. I'm hoping to make this part of a regular series because Ambassador Chen has so many wonderful colleagues who have their own insight too. And I hope to bring them aboard um, starting in the fall. But for now, um, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon and. Uh, thank you again, Ambassador Chen. I'll see you.